Next month's speaker will be Dana, his lovely wife, and she will be speaking on the, the uh, some of the demographic issues with the atheist movement dealing with uh, the gender gap that we have between the ladies and the uh, the dudes and the um, well said. <laughs> right. That, that's some of the stuff we'll be talking about. And uh, then the month after that, August, we will be having um, everyone's favorite Hayden will be back from Camp Quest, and her and possibly some of the other Questers, I think Kale maybe, will be talking about their experiences at Camp Quest. So we will be having the kids running the show, and uh, they will be telling us about what they did and their experiences and the pros and the cons. Basically, you get it. it'll be a follow-up from last month's event. And then the month after that will either be me or a guy that I'm trying to get. And I, if it's me, it will be on uh, hydraulic fracturing. <laughs> really? It's, it's actually a big issue in the news right now. Uh, wow. Sorry. Oh, Somebody shut a door. <laughs> that is so funny. Kids. I think it was my kid. Probably. <laughs> Um, it's your kid looks bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, actually, fracking is a big hot button political issue right now. And it will be what it is, why you need to know about it, and why it's controversial. Uh, Scientific American did a big uh, front page cover spread on it a couple of months ago. And um, it's been in the news a lot lately. I know that Discovery News has been covering it some. I think Chris Mooney's writing up a big article on it right now. And I was actually on a frack crew for couple of years for um, a certain large oil company named Halliburton. And um, so I can give you some first-hand experience on what it is and why it should be controversial. So look forward to that. And so first, for tonight, we're going to have James. Welcome, James. All right, are we ready to get going? I thought I'd talk to you guys about my new favorite hobby. So. That's what this talk is all about. Um, for those who don't know, I'm James. If you see me online, you probably see more complicated versions of my name. That's because James Gray is a little too common on the internet, so uh, I can use kind of some variations. Um, CJ asked me to explain why I'm qualified to give this talk. Ooh, that's a big ball of problems. Uh, I am a programmer in my day job, that's my mild-mannered disguise, and um, uh, programmers kind of have to have an analytical mind, it, uh, it's, it's basically a requirement of the job, so uh, maybe that's a qualification. Uh, another advantage is I do speak at conferences quite a bit, so I've got a fair bit of practice on that. The bad news for you guys is that I usually speak in front of 300 programmers, these are people that spend all day long talking to machines. So the bar is pretty low there, and this is the, the longest day of the year. So you could be in for quite a night, uh, not making any promises. So when I'm around programmers, the only thing I have to do is put something like this on the screen, and they're impressed. <laughs> are you impressed? Yes. Cool. It works, works on non-programmers, too. Um, this is the start of a Markov chain generator. Raise your hand if you know what a Markov chain generator is. Holy cow, that's so awesome. We have people that want to know. Okay, so how about raise your hand if you want to know what a Markov chain generator is. Awesome. I, I, actually, don't, I actually don't care. Uh, I, sorry to disappoint you, but I already made the slides, so you know, you're going down the road whether you like it or not you know, at this point. I'll try to play, explain it in plain English, though. Uh, so here I'm building a data structure uh, where I'm going to store some values, and I'll show you what that is. A Markov chain is a way of realistically generating random text. So if we wanted to generate random text, obviously I could write a program that would pick a bunch of random letters and string them together. The problem is that wouldn't make words very often, right? We would just end up with random junk and not necessarily the, uh, the word structure that we want. So in order to get better random text, we can feed it text to begin with. 
and we can teach it to pay attention to it and learn from it. So for example, we can learn from this that sometimes it's a good idea for the word James to follow the words is, and sometimes it's a good idea for the word not to follow the word is. And that's called a first order Markov chain, because we're looking one word backwards, that's the first order part. Or we could go two orders and look two words backwards, and we can get, the farther we go down that road, the more complicated things get, but the better the accuracy gets. And we can use this to generate things. So if I were to put that in a programming data structure, it would look something like this. We call it a hash, or a dictionary, or a map. Uh, because it is like a dictionary, right? It's got uh, keys on the left side and values on the right. So in a dictionary, you have a word that you're looking up, that's your key, and your value is your uh, definition, right, that you find in the dictionary. So the keys are the two words that came before, and the values are the list of words that can come next, right? So after seeing my name, then we should choose a random word. In this case, is is a good choice, or after we see name is, we can choose randomly between James and not. So this is how we build Markov chain generators. Um, and this code, I, I know you can't understand it, but this is written in that language I use in my day job called Ruby. And all this uh, chunk of code does, it's a reusable chunk of code that I can call anytime I want, pass in some text, and it generates that data structure I just showed you on the previous slide. So it builds that thing, that imaginary thing. And then this code does the other side of the problem. Um, once we've fed it a bunch of text and we have that data structure, then we can go through that and we can use it to generate output, right? We can generate imaginary text, fake text. Um, and this part right here does the part I talked about where you look at the last two words and you pick what comes next. And this part right here handles the other part of the problem. With that, just a Markov chain alone, you can't figure out how to get started because you don't have two words that came before the beginning of the document. So when I'm reading through, I pick some common ways to start documents, and then we pick one of them here, and that's how we get it started. So then I needed some text to feed it. And programmers use all kinds of things when they want to mess with these. It's common to use uh, Sherlock Holmes stories, because uh, there's quite a bit of them, and they tend to produce kind of some grim output that people like. Uh, I thought we'd have a little fun and go with fairy tales. So I googled around the internet until I found a site that had a bunch of fairy tales, and you can see all those little text links there. If you click one of those, it just brings up a plain text version of the story, right? So in this case, Cinderella. I, I know you can't read that. Um, but uh, just a bunch of text links. So I could have gone around and clicked all the text links and saved them, but programmers are kind of lazy, so. I wrote another piece of code that does that for me. <laughs> so when you run this part, it reads that page, that first one I showed you. It hunts for those text links. It goes and opens each of those pages, like your browser would. And uh, it pulls those texts and it feeds them into the Markov chain generator. So that's how we get the fairy tales in there. One more piece of code and I promise the pain is over after this slide. So uh, hang in there. The, um, we've got a couple of constants at the chart where I set things up, and then the middle chunk uh, is what does the reading of fairy tales. It also saves it off to a file, so I don't ever have to do that again. If I run it multiple times, I can skip the building part, and then after that, and then it's uh, faster. And then the last chunk kicks off the whole process, and I couldn't decide how many fairy tales I ought to generate for you guys, so I downloaded the Bible, and I saw how long that was, I'm like, that's a good number, let's use that. So I generated a Bible's worth of fairy tales. And that's what we did. Probably you're landing on a question like this right about now. <laughs> Me too. Um, I would love to tell you that programmers have good reasons for using Markov generators. <laughs> I could even make up a couple if you want me to. Um, we do sometimes try to say they have realistic purposes. But the truth is we mostly do it because it's a blast. Um, and I'll show you why. And um, sometimes you get things like this out of them. Um, <laughs> and they can be kind of thought provoking sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good, right? 
and a little bit disturbing. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but those first two are not the version of Pinocchio I was. <laughs> so I got to thinking about it, you get your nonsense, you get your deep thoughts, you get your disturbing stuff. This is basically the Bible, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That joke works on atheists just like it does on programmers. <laughs> so my other role, my superhero costume, of course, is uh, atheist by night. And um, when I'm not being a programmer. So I, I actually want to compare and contrast the two communities for you now, um, since I've spent lots of time in both of them. Uh, in the programming community, you know what happens, I just showed it to you. I go there, I show some code, they all laugh, and it's fun. Um, when I was getting ready to do this atheist talk, I went to the hideaway meetup uh, before this month, and uh, one atheist, I don't want to name names, but he's sitting over there, um, threatened me if I, uh, this wet talk didn't live up to his expectations. He kind of let that threat trail off, so I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, another atheist came up to me and said, um, you know, it would be really great if you could find a way to use the words like pineapple and protective order in the same sentence. Cheer. They're like, oh. <laughs> so we don't know who that is. Um, and then tonight, my wife comes up to me and says, uh, you know, my mom's coming to this, so it better be good. Hi, Mom. Hello, Sean. So, um, you know, I'm going back to speaking to programmers after this. So I've been a non-believer for a long time, but I'm actually new to the community. I've only been here about a year, uh, which is kind of cool because I have lots of new words for things that I didn't have before. I had the belief system and things like that, but I'm just now learning what things are called and that we have culture built up around these ideas that, that I've had for a long time. I like that. I enjoy that. So atheism to me is kind of divided into uh, multiple sects. Obviously we're interested in theology or maybe anti-theology. Uh, there's you know, quite a few of us that are pretty into philosophy. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble with this, but say I find it kind of boring. Uh, it seems like it ends up in semantic arguments to me. Uh, Really? Yeah, I know. Thanks. <laughs> By semantic, what do you mean? <laughs> but there's this other side, right? This skepticism side uh, that I've really enjoyed. Um, and obviously there's overlap and there may be others that I'm missing. But these are, these are the things I've seen. So we're going to focus in on just that one circle and kind of go for a dive there and see what we can learn. So, all right, we've already established that I can't use my normal tricks of just throwing a code on the slide, so I figured we'd just talk about what's on my mind, right? <laughs> you guys knew that, right? I'm a guy. Come on. No, no guesses there. Does anybody know what this person is doing? Make it Anybody have other guesses of what this person is doing? Is it a remedy for um, breastfeeding, something like that? That's pretty close. It's pretty close. So, I don't get a lot of sleep now because I have a little baby. And uh, my wife and I used to have uh, season tickets to the symphony. And so we would go, you know, and we were already sleep deprived, and then you go listen to classical music for two hours, and uh, then you're driving home in the dark, and my mind kind of wanders. So I was thinking, uh, you know, I think Dana's going to stop breastfeeding soon. We probably should go buy some cabbage. And I probably need to explain that, because <laughs> I was told when I went to those breastfeeding classes you're supposed to go to, that if you put cabbage on your breast, you will stop lactating. Okay. So you guys know that's, uh, that's what this girl is doing right here. I got it off of a pregnancy site, and they're showing you how you stop lactating. So it being night and me being tired, and I start thinking, so how exactly does that work? Which is probably not a question you should ever ask. Um, yeah, right. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to think. So what? Literally, let's assume this is true. What are the possible ways this could happen? 
Um, so maybe there's something in cabbage, right, that like shuts off lactation, right? You could buy that. But if that's the case, it seems like applying it topically would not be the most effective way to get that quantity, right? I mean, shouldn't you eat it or something? And then when we have news stories about like, you know, people who are obsessed with cabbage stew that keep accidentally shutting off their breastfeeding or something, I don't know. It seems like we would have heard of that, so I, I didn't buy that too much. Um, and then the other way I was thinking, I was like, well, maybe cabbage puts out something that like, you know, onions make you cry, right? Maybe it's something like that, and if you're just close enough to it, or exposed to it over time, maybe that would do it. But then I have to think about that, and then wouldn't the cabbage aisle at the grocery store be kind of dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shouldn't they have like warning signs in front of that, you know? If you're lactating, maybe you should avoid this aisle. <laughs> or there'd be news stories about, you know, some poor grocery worker who didn't know better and now she can't rescue her baby anymore. I know I keep going back to this news story thing, but I always see those news stories where they're like, so, sir, you get on the roller coaster when you saw the swirling cloud drop out of the sky? You know, I figure if they're going to show that, they're going to show the guys that do this, right? So, I don't know. I couldn't figure out how it works. So, uh, I Googled it, because that's what I do. Uh, yeah. And uh, I ran into some of these arguments. Here's one. I know it sounds weird, but you can put cabbage leaves on your breast and it will dry your milk out. I did it and it works. Uh, okay. So what she's saying is she stopped breastfeeding and she put cabbage leaves on her boobs and then she wasn't lactating anymore after a while, right? And how does she know it works? I mean, like, she said, wow, that seemed quick. So she went to her husband and said, honey, I need you to knock me up again so that I can go through the pregnancy process, have another kid, breastfeed, stop. This time I won't use cabbage leaves and we'll compare the times. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm sure that was it. And there we go. Um, how about this one? Cool cabbage compresses will reduce swelling quickly. And if left in place for long periods, will help diminish milk supply. This method may be used instead of or in addition to removing small amounts of milk to reduce supply. Uh, use fresh green leaves, cleaned and chilled, wrapped around the breast. Change them about every two hours. <laughs> wow, there's a lot going on there. Uh, <laughs> so you gotta get them cold, you gotta swap them out about every two hours, like when they're not cold anymore. Uh, this looks like you may have to do some other things and over a quote, long period, apparently that diminishes supply. Interesting. Um, these arguments are uh, bad arguments. I assume that goes without saying. They're a special kind of bad argument. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So as I ran into these, I, I kind of started to smell, smell spoiled milk, and I assumed something was up here. And then I thought back, like, okay, so who told me this in the first place? And the answer was, it was the lady that taught the breastfeeding class at Lakeside. And I now know that about 98% of everything she told me was bullshit. I had <laughs> so, you know, she's not exactly a reliable authority. So, I, I kept searching, and sure enough, if you look hard enough, you can find the scientific study where they tested to see if cabbage leaves uh, help when you're uh, stopping lactation. Anybody want to take a guess? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs down, the crowd's saying, that's right, it does not work. Um, it, the cool aspect of it, if you chill them, does help relieve just the pressure. It doesn't help stop lactation, but it helps relieve the pressure. And any cold item will do, or a cream, or anything like that, all works the same. Um, it's just a relief. Uh, it, cabbage leaves may have been used in the past because they're convenient to apply the rest, I don't know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Um, but this kind of gets to the point of what we're after when we look for evidence, right? And we want a scientific study, preferably double-blinded so neither side knows what's going on. We'd like it to be published in a peer-reviewed journal so that lots of people can say, hey, this is kind of stupid. And um, it placebo control, you know, we all know about that placebo effect and that, you know, if we just start doing something to you that makes you feel different, 
and we can measure that and we need to account for that when we're checking things. These words don't guarantee you get right answers, they just increase the odds that you get better answers, right? So those are kind of important. Okay, so we're going to call that myth busting. Um, this is the other cool part about skepticism, by the way. We have our own culture. Did you guys know that? Like, Mythbusters is part of our culture. Adam Savage is a huge skeptic. He comes to all the skeptic events, right, and stuff. And then we have magicians like James Randi, Penn and Teller and stuff. So that's one of the awesome parts of being a skeptic is that we get, we get to take advantage of this cool culture. Apparently, being a magician is the gateway drug to skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> so I left this example in there because it shows the process, right? That's what's important. Uh, add some questions, think critically about it, and then eventually you got to search for evidence. you got to prove it or find somebody that proved it or you know, something like that. Okay, so let's go into what skepticism really is. I looked for definitions, and I don't really like any of them. These are some things that uh, are kind of skeptical, I agree with. The first one seems to be kind of our golden rule. Um, and, and then there's other parts, but I really, the last one is the most important to me because it says that what we really care about is the evidence, the facts, right? We want to know the facts of uh, these facts that we're being fed. We want to know what the truth behind them is. Okay, so what are the kinds of things skeptics are interested in? Um, lots of things. Like, first, I already said uh, that there are certain kind of arguments that are bad. Let's talk about those. Now, we call them logical fallacies, and I imagine most people attending an atheist meetup are semi-familiar with logical fallacies, um, because you've probably run into them in the past. But let's try a few. Let's see how you do. There are certain kinds of logical arguments that we make all the time, and sometimes we make them very badly. They're not well-formed arguments, right? So, for example, this one says, Christianity has the largest group of followers because it's the best religion. Uh, that, true or false, it's a bad argument. Um, it's actually a special kind of bad argument. Does anybody know what it's called? Bandwagon fallacy? Uh, bandwagon fa I've never heard it called that, maybe. I've heard it called the ad populi argument. Oh, well, oh, Latin is so much better than right. English. Yeah. I see how it is. So is that the Oklahoma version of that? <laughs> and Canada. We speak English the and, whole way through. I got you. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is the argument your teenager always gives you, right? Uh, well, everybody else is doing it, right? That's that kind of argument. That, just because everybody else is doing something does not make it a good argument. In case you didn't know that, I'm just going to go ahead and let in on that secret. <laughs> At one point in time, most doctors in the world thought it was a good idea that when you get sick, we attach leashes to your body, or poke holes in you and let you bleed. Not a good idea, really. <laughs> you know, it's not the way to go. Um, so that's bad. How about this one? This one's a little trickier. God exists because the Bible says so. The Bible is inspired. Therefore, we know God exists. Circular. It's a circular argument. It's a circular argument. It's often like called begging the question, where you actually need the premise to be true <laughs> to prove the, um, to prove the uh, uh, premise, right? It's, it uses itself. The Bible is inspired, supposedly, by God, so uh, it can't be used to prove God's existence. Okay, how about this one? Either God exists or evolution is true. False dichotomy. False dichotomy, perfect. And he would use the word I would have used. Um, so, yeah. That one's perfect. I know that we would love to believe that this one's true, but it's not. Um, right, because uh, it forces us down to two choices which don't necessarily have to be dependent on each other. If we took a um, deist view of God, right, that God created the universe and it was kind of hands off, uh, then evolution could still exist in that role and stuff. And, and it, we could have both of them, theoretically. 